I want to thank the organizers uh, for giving me the opportunity to present a uh, topic of crossing occlusions uh, in an extraction uh, program. My topic is when and how. I think the when is fairly simple. When you want to get venous access to add or replace a lead using fibroplasty, and when the leads causing the fibrous obstruction are over six months old. Why do we call this fibroplasty and not venoplasty? Well, it's simple. The obstruction is the result of aggressive fibrous tissue reaction to the leads. The veins have really been replaced by fibrous tissue. The rules and tools of atherosclerotic vascular intervention really don't apply to lead-induced uh, fibrosis. So let's put fibroplasty in perspective by, comparison, by comparing it uh, to obliterative extraction, where you vaporize or mechanically pulverize the tissue surrounding a lead. And when you do a venogram after such a procedure, it often looks like this. Whereas with fibroplasty, all we're doing is dilating the fibro, uh, fibrous tissue. Fibroplasty can be performed by the implanting physician safely and successfully. Um, we published our series of 373 cases back in 2011, and we had no cl adverse clinical outcomes, including our learning curve cases. And it was, a, it was very quick, 13 minutes to cross and dilate the obstruction. What about compared to progressively larger dilators? When compared to progressively larger dilators, it reduced implant time by an hour and it reduced implant failure from 25% to zero. Compared to tunneling, the procedure time uh, was reduced by 40 minutes when fibroplasty was used. And when fibroplasty was used, it reduced the acute complications, most of which required invasive intervention and or transfusion from eight to zero. How to cross fibrous obstruction. And again, what we're gonna talk about is a situation where the wire just doesn't go right across easily and you're dealing with restricted catheter mobility. To cross an occlusion, you really need pr process optimization. The patient needs to be hydrated, the legs need to be elevated. You need a proper table at the proper height and a proper position. Um, you need to have all the tools in the room. And the initial venous access, um, it needs to be lateral and femoral access occasionally adds to this. We'll talk about what to expect from a wire alone, how to substitute a, an angled hydrophilic catheter, um, how to add power to cross, and then finally, if you can't cross, how you can remove the lead retaining the wire and perform fibroplasty. So the essential equipment uh, is a five French stiffened micropuncture catheter. Uh, I like the long one because if you get through, it's nice to have something long across the occlusion. You're gonna want to have a five French angled hydrophilic braided catheter that's 40 to 60 centimeters in length. You're gonna need a contrast injection system with a rotating hemostatic valve. The balloons that you're gonna want are a nine millimeter, just simple, not one nine millimeter balloon, uh, but it's ideal that it goes to 35 atmospheres. And there's really only one company currently that makes that. There may be another one shortly. We also like to have a six millimeter balloon for pre-dilatation. It's non-compliant, but it's not nearly as tough as our nine millimeter balloon. It only goes up to 14 atmospheres. You need an inflation device that goes to 35 atmospheres and wires. We want an 035 inch angle glide wire, an 018 inch angle glide wire, and an 018 inch angle, or a straight V18 control wire. Look at initial venous access. You need to enter the vein as far lateral as possible. And you can see here in the AP projection, it, it looks as if you stick here, um, that you're going to end up um, hitting the uh, lung. Whereas if you go caudal, you realize uh, that you can hit the vein anywhere along here. 
And um, so it's very important to do that. The other thing is you got to keep the needle coaxial. And if you try sticking within the pocket, you frequently end up coming at the vein in a, in a bad angle. So it's important to be comfortable sticking through the skin to keep the needle coaxial. Just another, just an example of the difference between caudal, um, 30 degrees of caudal and an AP in terms of comfort with hitting the vein uh, peripheral to the occlusion. To advance the long stiffened micropuncture catheter, uh, we have the wire in and now we're advancing the catheter. It's nice to have a stiffened micropuncture catheter because this fibrous tissue can be very uh, stiff and oftentimes if you don't have a stiffened dilator, it's hard to get through the, to, through the occlusion. You want to advance gently and not push. Sometimes you're not certain whether you've got the tip of your micropuncture in the catheter. Uh, there's a way to find out. Uh, what you do is you remove the dilator, uh, retaining the wire, and then attach your injection system around the wire uh, like this, and then inject contrast. And that confirms uh, that we actually have uh, the tip of the micropuncture catheter in the, in the vein. The next step then is to define the anatomy by injecting contrast. And now you can see uh, what we didn't see before, which is there is an area to cross the occlusion. Wires alone frequently uh, have difficulty crossing occlusions. So here we're trying first a micropuncture wire and then a glide wire, and we couldn't get across. So we get out our uh, five French angled hydrophilic catheter, um, and we, we're putting it in here over a glide wire that's been placed up into the collaterals. The mic, once we get our angled catheter in, we have it attached to the contrast injection system with a rotating hemostatic valve. And then we can use this just like it's a glide wire and with puffs of contrast uh, to cross the occlusion. And you can see um, that you can manipulate the catheter uh, just like it was a glide wire to get through the occlusion. Uh, I like it better because I, I think of it as a glide wire with eyes. I, I know always know where I am, so I like that better uh, than a glide wire alone. The next step is to do your dilatation. It's important to remember that there's often a second occlusion uh, when you do the first, so you want to uh, take your balloon out to the innominate STC junction, do your first inflation, and then you can gently pull it back um, if there's no waste until you encounter the inclusion, you then deflate the balloon um, and bring it back and do a head to tail overlap inflating it until all the wastes are gone. And you just inflate the balloon long enough for the waste to disappear uh, and for the uh, pressure to be stable. You want to make sure that your final uh, inflation uh, is with the tail of the balloon visible in the pocket. This really worries everybody, uh, but uh, it doesn't cause people to bleed out. If you need to, you can put a hemostatic suture on. Adding femoral access can be helpful uh, if you can't get access from above. If you define the extent of the occlusion from below, you'll be surprised sometimes how far you go. And you can see here we're able to work the catheter all the way up. And again, you'll notice that we're using the catheter alone and not relying uh, on the wire. This is just an example of a case where the, the stick was too far central um, and it couldn't get the wire through the occlusion. So when we, we did the case, um, we started off caudal and you can see now how it's easy to stick the vein. You can see the vein indent and we were through the occlusion in no time. So it's really important uh, to stick the vein caudal to the occlusion. One of the things that I, I don't think people understand is that a wire alone can lead you astray. So here we have the occlusion and uh, I'm working with a fellow and he puts he put the wire out and, and it stopped. So he came and took another picture and now you can see that the wire sort of torn things up. Uh, so what we do is we now go in with our angled hydrophilic catheter and we can, we can keep on track uh, staying out of those collaterals, um, puffing a little contrast to be sure we're, that we're in the, the vein uh, and then advance a wire um, added to the central circulation 
um, and then cross the occlusion, and then we can perform our fibroplasty. So one of the odd things is that people think that the open lumen catheter is dangerous when I think it's actually the other way around. Just another example of, of using uh, the angled hydrophilic catheter to cross an occlusion. We get our wire in, we have our microcatheter, catheter taking a picture. We realize it's going to be tight, so we get out our angled hydrophilic catheter uh, and we use it uh, to cross the occlusion, um, driving it along until we get to the anomaly SVC junction and then put out the glide wire and come back and do fibroplasty. Occasionally, you can't cross with a wire in the catheter, and so one of the things you can use is this power wire that we used. Uh, we put that across the occlusion, one second of RF uh, energy, um, and then we're through the occlusion. If you can't cross with a retained uh, guide wire technique, um, one of the other options you can use is retained wire lead removal followed by fab fibroplasty. Um, this requires there to be some degree of lead mobility um, and it can replace uh, fibro the femoral snare and traditional obliterative extraction. Uh, and that's actually where we first started using it. Um, you, you confirm that there's some degree of lead mobility, so you unscrew and cut off the connector um, and just dis disengage it from the myocardium, 014 wire in the lumen, and then remove the lead from below, pull pulling the inserted wire into the central circulation. For LV leads, you do this by just putting the wire through the through the lumen of the catheter. So this is an example where we would be, we would be prepped for extraction, um, but we find that the lead uh, is actually quite mobile. Uh, so what would we do is we know we're going to have to snare it, so we cut off the connector and advance the angioplasty wire to the tip of the lead, snare the lead from below, and then rather than performing obliterative extraction, what we'll do is We'll just pull that wire right into the central circulation um, and then bring a uh, Amplatz wires. Do it. Here we're actually pre-dilating and now we're going uh, with our 9 millimeter uh, balloon. Removing leads from below, the accordion effect. I think you'll find that leading, removing leads from below is, as Dr. Schaller says, sometimes shockingly easy. And I think it's because when you pull it from above, you get this accordion effect, whereas you pull it before, from below with the IS-1 connector out, uh, you stretch the lead. So in summary, dilatation of veins with chronic leads is best called fibroplasty, not venoplasty. Fibroplasty reduces implant time, increases success and is safer than tunneling. Initial process optimization is critical. Peripheral location of the initial venous access is important. Defining the occlusion by a femoral axis can be occasionally helpful. You want to use an angled hydrophilic catheter with puffs of contrast in place of wire alone. You can add power to cross an occlusion that would include RF, a micro laser, or micro dissection. If you can't cross, Consider using retained wire lead removal followed by fibroplasty. This requires some degree of lead mobility and can replace femoral snaring uh, and traditional ex uh, obliterative extraction.